Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today we're sitting down to discuss The Beekeeper of Aleppo, the best-selling novel chosen by public vote for this year's National Reading Group Day here in the UK. It tells the story of a Syrian couple, an artist and a beekeeper, who are forced to flee their home in Aleppo and travel across Turkey and Europe in the hopes of achieving asylum in the UK. Its author, Christy Lefteri, worked for two summers as a volunteer at a refugee centre in Athens, and the novel was born out of her experiences there. The Reading Agency, the charity behind National Reading Group Day, have invited us all to get involved. And so we are, with a special book club episode and discussion with fellow podcast host Anna Bailey Karras, who's dialing in from her home in Adelaide, Australia. Anna's weekly podcast, Books on the Go, always keeps us up to date with brilliant book reviews and author interviews. Hers is one of the voices we trust to steer us towards or away from a book, and we can't wait to find out what she made of this one. Anna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, hi. It's a pleasure to be here. The cover of this book says number one international bestseller. But I have to say, I'd never heard of it. Had either of you come across this before? I had heard of it, but I'm not sure where. But in my head, I knew it was a very popular, quite mainstream novel. And I will admit, I came to it with some snobbery. I picked up my copy in the local (laughs) Sainsbury's. I always think that if a book is stocked in the grocery stores, it can't be very good, which is really not the attitude to have. And, you know, to get straight to it, I think I was definitely proven wrong in this case. But it's strange. I just don't think it's really cracked the magazines we read. The Guardian did a very, very short review of it. And I tried to find more reviews and it was really hard pressed. I hadn't heard of it at all. It hadn't crossed my radar at all. Let's just talk a little bit more about the story. We've got two main characters, Nuri, who's a beekeeper, and his wife, Afra, who's an artist. And they live happily in the beautiful Syrian city of Aleppo until the civil war begins and things get worse and worse and worse. And their young son is killed by a bomb blast. And at that point, they are forced to flee. But what Afra has seen is so terrible that she's gone blind. They must embark on a perilous journey through Turkey and Greece towards an uncertain future in Britain. And so we're following their external journey through Europe, across the border into Turkey, from Turkey into Greece, and then from Greece they eventually make it to the UK via Spain, and they stay in various refugee camps on the way. But it's also their internal journey, isn't it? And the trauma that they've experienced sends them both down quite different psychological paths. So I thought one of the things that's really clever about this book is the way that you've got this internal journey that they're both going on and and they're lost and it's about them finding each other once again. There's so much going on in this novel it's quite hard to know where to start isn't it but at its core I thought was that relationship between Nuri and Afra. Anna what did you think of them? I didn't love this book for the first two thirds. I was drawn in by the end But no, I didn't love it, but I also felt bad feeling critical of it because I think it's such an important issue and I think she writes about it, including, as you say, the marriage and that relationship between Nuri and Afra with such compassion and warmth and sensitivity. So I think I wanted to love it more than I did just because I could see the sincerity. But you're right, there's so much to it. There was so much going on and I think... Had it been a bit tighter and written slightly differently, I would have been even more engaged. For me, it was very sad, obviously, but just very sad throughout and also quite slow and the flashbacks kept taking me out of the story into a more remote story. So I found it hard to feel the urgency or the suspense that you want in a narrative but then I feel bad <laughs> because it's, it's a so, tricky one, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. It's not the kind of book you can criticize really because it's this no. extraordinarily important subject and it's so necessary that we do read things like this and we don't look away and we do try to understand the stories of these people, these human beings just like us. 
who yeah. are in intolerable situations. And I thought this is certainly a good example of, you know, as one of the fulsome publicity quotes on the cover says, the power of storytelling, you mm. know, that a novel it can is. take you into the character's life and you empathise and you almost experience what they've experienced in a way that a news report or something you see on TV doesn't necessarily give you the same sense of knowing and understanding that I think you get from this. But yeah, it's a hard one to <laughs> pick know. apart the writing or say, well, I think this was a bit contrived <laughs> or, you know... As you say, I really grappled with that issue of we are bearing witness and where is the balance between a book that makes you bear witness to something that you're uncomfortable with or that makes you feel incredibly sad? What's the balance between having to do that versus how much should you enjoy the book, Mm. I guess? I struggled with the first third. It's not the kind of novel I ever seek out and I really struggled for the first third. I wasn't enjoying it and I didn't think the writing and the depth of characterization was strong enough. But actually then that all just sort of fell away when the character Muhammad enters and you begin to realize that something is wrong with our narrator and then it becomes much more complex. I just finished this book last night and I was weeping by the end. (laughs) And I think we're supposed to be weeping, but I went into my husband and he was just like, oh my God. (laughs) Perhaps we're all feeling extra vulnerable right now. It's not an unhappy ending, but at the same time, how can we feel happy at all, given what they've been through? Mm, and that so many people like them are going to I think well yes exactly exactly it's an interesting combination isn't it because it's not hard to read in terms of the prose but it's emotionally such a difficult read it's very powerful very affecting I felt very guilty when I finished it because the Syrian war has been going on for almost a decade now and I think it was all very much on our radar for a while there because the media were actually covering it. And then I think attention just shifts onto other issues. And obviously the coronavirus is taking up everyone's attention right now. But there are hundreds of thousands of individuals living in these conditions right now and we're not even thinking about them anymore. It's not being reported. Yeah, you're right. It has fallen out of the news, hasn't it? Or maybe I haven't paid attention closely Um, enough. But I think it has. And the conflict has also moved to other cities is what I was reading this morning. So it's not centred in Aleppo anymore. It's now in a a different city called Idlib. I think that's one of the things that's interesting about the book is that even our main two characters don't really know or understand the causes of the civil war, the politics that leads up to that. I thought that's quite interesting because it's their experience and their experiences. They're just ordinary people trying to live their lives and they get swept up in this thing. They get caught up in this thing that's going on all around them. But it's not anything that they have any control over. They don't have any agency. The novel sort of skates over all that. But I thought that was OK because it's their experience. They don't really know what's going on. All they know is the reality that they're living with day to day. One of the issues I had with this book when I began it is that Christy Lefteri has never been to Syria for obvious reasons. She is the daughter of Cypriot refugees who came to the UK. And then obviously, yes, she volunteered in these refugee centres in Athens where she met many, many refugees and talked to them about their experiences. So initially, I did kind of question her right to tell this story, although That's such a spiral, you know, when you get into who can tell which stories, which is always a discussion, I think, in this day and age. Yeah, I thought her having worked in those camps in Greece, you could see that she came to it with some level of authenticity in terms of having really lived with and heard these stories. Mm. And she obviously feels that this is an issue of great urgency. And I could feel that sincerity coming through. The book that I was comparing it with was No Friend But The Mountains by Beruz Bouchani, which is an own voices memoir of a similar journey but attempting to come to Australia. This didn't stand up to that in terms of the real authentic experience, I suppose, but I did think she was informed by genuine stories. It did feel genuine from that point of view. I wonder, though, if the novel strengthens as it goes along because she's on more familiar footing. As I say, for me, it came alive when they arrived in Athens. Before then, I had no real sense of what Aleppo was like. I had no real sense of what their life was like. And just circling back to your point, Kate, I struggle with the idea that these two 
quite intelligent characters, quite prosperous characters, wouldn't have some stronger views about the political situation in Syria, that mm. there wouldn't be more to say about that, because it is quite foggy what's happening. Did you feel like they could have left sooner? I was getting annoyed that they didn't leave sooner and then I felt bad for being annoyed because what a horrible decision to have to make. Because you want uh, them the, to go, don't you? You want yes. them to flee. Because we have all this hindsight and we know... I thought that was one of the very powerful things was this idea of home and the idea, you know, they lose their son. Their son is killed in a bomb blast. And even then, even after his death, it's the wife, Afra. She refuses to leave. You know, things are just collapsing all around them. The danger is off the chart every day, but she mm. won't go. And she won't go because she can't leave her son and their home and their possessions and her memories. It's all there. And it really just made me realize something I think we know but you know when you read it in a novel like this you sort of really feel it and understand it that these people they don't leave because they want to leave you know they no. leave because there is no other choice they're driven away and even then it's with this reluctance it's a sort of act of total despair to have to flee and so yeah this idea that when they come to the UK I think you do get a really strong sense then of the displacement you find out yeah. really early on in the novel don't you that they've made it to the UK chapter two I think Nuri is writing from a boarding house somewhere sort of seaside town where they've been lodged while their asylum claim is processed so you know quite early on that they make it but you have such a vivid sense of everything that they've left behind and where their hearts are. And that even yeah. though they're now in a place where it's safe and they can walk around without fear of being shot or blown up, they've lost something. Something has They're not something... at home. Yeah. Richard Flanagan, who you may know of, he's the author of The Narrow Road to the Deep North, which mm. won the Booker a few years ago. And he's an Australian author. He went with Ben Quilty. I think they were seconded to travel to Lebanon and a couple of other places, Jordan, where there were refugee camps with Syrian refugees. One of the things Richard Flanagan said was, we in Australia complain about all these boat arrivals and all these asylum seekers wanting to come here and acting as though they're desperate to come to Australia. He said they actually would much rather not come to Australia or to England for that matter. They're desperate to go home. They would love to go home if they could. That's where they really want to be. It's almost arrogance to think that we would be the place they'd really like to be. Mm, this novel feels like such an important counterpoint to media coverage, even left-wing media coverage of the refugee crisis, for that reason, in that you actually understand the motivations behind leaving. You have to. You're forced to sort of shake off this idea that the UK or Australia or Canada are, are the promised land and they've made it, whereas mm. actually, you know, it's only really the beginning, I think, of healing if that's even possible i think a sense of alienation can happen even once you've arrived where you intended to be what do you have left perhaps although this book i think is much more optimistic at the end because we have a family being reunited his cousin and business partner mustafa has made it to the uk ahead of him where he sent his wife and daughter earlier on and his character was based on a real person that Christy Lefteri met who is doing this very thing. He's based in Yorkshire and he was a beekeeper back in Syria and an academic. And he has set up this project here in the UK to, uh, what do you call it, raise bees? <laughs> what is the term <laughs> for beekeeping? To but but to work bees? with, yes, yeah, to tend them, to work with refugees and people coming to the UK and to teach them about beekeeping. And that project is really flourishing. And so it gave her the inspiration for this character. But I think that thread of, you know, whether it's beekeeping or whether it's art or whether it's, you know, whatever people have, that's their thing that really motivates them and moves them and is meaningful to them in life. He still has that. That hasn't gone away. And I think the thing that stops this novel being an unbearable read is that it does have this thread of hope and this idea that there are still things that we have that can regrow, can flourish in a new place. And there's that sense of possibility at the end that I think is probably quite an important part of telling these stories. Yeah, I do love the idea of this book as an entry point for people to walk a mile in someone else's shoes and understand this crisis from a Syrian refugee's point of view. And I loved that bit of hope that Mustafa offers 
but that wasn't enough for me overall. I thought that hope, it was there, but overall the sad tone. I don't mind being devastated by a book and Mm -hmm. having the tears and that incredibly moving ending is fine if you've had lighter moments as well. I'm not suggesting that there's any comedy to be had here or anything like that, but... I like books that that have a bit more balance between light and dark and this for me was so sad. On the other hand, those two characters, Nuri and Aphra, are so grief-stricken, they're feeling dead inside and so it makes sense that there's a flatness to it and it makes sense that if it doesn't feel like it's coming to life, that kind of reflects how they're feeling. So maybe that was partly deliberate. I think I liked the writing. I was sort of sensing I liked it more than you two did. I thought it was actually really lovely the way that particularly that idea of this inner journey and this psychological journey. With Aphra, it's a physiological effect. We know that she's lost her sight and it's due to this bomb blast that she experienced. With Nuri, you don't actually realise it much as he himself doesn't realise it, but he's actually undergoing a psychological breakdown of his own as a result of post-traumatic stress. The character that you mentioned very fleetingly earlier on, Laura, Muhammad, little boy that he meets, who he takes along with them, he tries to help him along their journey. Is this a real character or is this a manifestation of Nuri's sadness and his longing for his son? I thought that was really beautifully done. And also the sort of dream sequences and the idea of tokens, you know, a key, a flower, dreamlike sequences, but also you sense that there are things going on in reality that he's sort of sleepwalking or something. And I thought all that was really well observed and that really captured my imagination. I'm actually on the same page with you, Kate. I wasn't in the beginning, but I was completely won over. Even the transitions that happen between the present day in this B&B in England, where the last sentence of the chapter doesn't end, but turns into the header on the next page. Mm, It's a real narrative device, isn't it? Which then leads in to the next chapter Mm. that might be a bit difficult to envision if you haven't read it so just looking at one transition this is Nuri I put my hands over my ears but it doesn't block out and then you turn the page and the header is the song and then you turn the page it's leading on from the song the song of the crickets greeted us as we arrived at Pedion to Arios and we've gone back in time now I was even Mm. won over by that device which when I first encountered it felt a bit much I was like yes I agree "Mm -mm." Yeah. I agree. I agree. At the beginning, I was like, "Oh, I'm not sure. Because <laughs> it just feels a bit contrived and it jolts you slightly out of the narrative. But I agree with you, Laura. I think in a way, it actually started to work more and more and more as the book went on and I became more and more absorbed. But Anna, to your point, there are moments in this novel where I thought, is it realistic that it is this horrible? I think it can be worse Mm. and I mean I'll come to this memoir that I've read. Every horrible thing felt absolutely true and that's why I was very uncomfortable not wanting to read it in the sense that I think it's important that people do read it. I just wanted to love it more so that I could sort of foist it on all my friends and tell everybody to read it in Mm. in the way that you do when you really love a book. I just wished that it had hit home in that way for me. But certainly by the end, the key and those things did nothing for me because I could sense where that storyline was heading, Mm. as I'm sure you could. But then it did get me in because then they become relevant and you find out more about the importance or the significance of those tokens And that really broke my heart. And, you know, it just, even when you don't want to be taken there to those really heartbreaking places, you know, she did get me there. So it certainly drew me in by the end. And I did really fall for Nuri and Afra by the end. And I loved how their characters almost reversed what starts off as one dynamic almost reverses itself by the end. Yeah, I agree. That was really good. I thought she did that beautifully and very subtly. I'm probably judging it a bit too harshly, I think. It's a weird one. I wouldn't ever seek this out, but Mm. I'm glad I read it. I felt, in a way, it's like a call to arms. You don't want to just sit and do nothing when you finish this book. I certainly turned the last page and thought, oh my God, I'm doing nothing. What can I do? And I read this, I just put my children to bed. And our baby was insisting in sleeping in our bed, which is normally where I do my reading. And just for once, I thought I'd indulge her. I know it's such a dangerous, slippery slope, but just for (laughs) once, I thought I'd indulge her. And so I left her in there and I went into her room and sat on her sofa and opened this to read it. And I was thinking I'd read for 10 minutes and then I'd go and move her. And I think I was probably there for two hours. I kind of couldn't stop. And there was this 
almost visceral sense of the danger, the trauma, the tragedy, the grief that these characters were going through. And here was I living in my house in London with my two children upstairs and my baby asleep in my bed and they were safe and they were looked after and I didn't have to put them in a boat and make a journey across the sea with them where I didn't know whether you know you can't read all that and then sit and do nothing I did feel Mm. changed by this Mm. I think it's really interesting Anna you saying about we judge books as we come to them don't we and I can completely see if you'd read something that almost did that but in a different way or a more powerful way I could see how this might perhaps pale in comparison for me this is the first thing I've read on this particular story so I was devastated by it, but almost in a good way. I'm glad I read it. Yeah. And I, I didn't enjoy reading it exactly, but it was a really compulsive, powerful experience. And I, I would try and get other people to read it, I think, because I, yeah. I feel it's a book that people should read. And I thought for a choice for the reading agency to promote, it's such a good book because it's a good story. I think it's well told. For me, she did a good job. Hopefully people will read this and it will help. A little bit and that that's part of maybe the sense of hopefulness that you're left with at the end that there are people like Christy left there are people mm. who are trying to help and that we can help and maybe it's about saying to us okay have a think how can we help what can we do I think from memory she does put some resources at the end of the book. Yes. In Australia, there's the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre. So one simple thing is you can donate to that agency or you can volunteer like she has or send them a care package during the COVID lockdown because they've had increased demand. That's the sort of thing. It just shakes you up a bit and puts things into perspective, doesn't it, when you read stories like that? I just wanted to read her last little closing thought. There's a little note from the author at the end. And she said, The Beekeeper of Aleppo is a work of fiction, but Nuri and Afra developed in my heart and mind as a result of every step I took beside the children and the families who made it to Greece. I have written a story as a way of revealing the way we are with the people we care about most in the world when we have suffered so much loss. The Beekeeper of Aleppo is about profound loss, but it is also about love and finding light. This is what I saw and heard and felt on the streets and camps in Athens. I thought there was hope in the dynamic and friendships that were blossoming in the B&B between the different inhabitants. So the older Moroccan man. Yeah, he uh, was my favorite, I think. Calling everyone geezer and really doing his best to support Afra, support Nuri in a very gentle way. And then there's the heartbreaking young man from the Côte d'Ivoire, Diamandi, with the shoulder blades, with the wings Mm. coming out of it. And there's a moment of magic realism when Nuri sees these wings. I loved the moment when Diamandi was talking about why he had come to the UK. He's preparing for his interview with UK immigration to claim asylum. And he talks briefly about his own life, but then begins to talk in great detail about the political situation in Côte d'Ivoire and the history. And I thought Mm. that was a really important important story to tell because even Nuri says we are the lucky refugees because we're from the worst place in the world we have the best chance of being let into the UK whereas a young man like Diamandi he's probably going to be turned away yeah and sent home even though he is very very desperate himself and his family are in very desperate circumstances and I was grateful to Lefteri for bringing in that narrative because I do think we stumble into this idea that there are worthy refugees and unworthy refugees and migrants versus refugees and actually Mm. it comes back to what we were saying earlier about how these people have left their homes not because they wanted to but because they had to they have no other choice there's one character here who says she's been waiting for seven years because she appealed the decision to be sent Mm, back Mm. and so this limbo that's what i think might haunt me the most about this book is the limbo these individuals find themselves in like athens it's just hell on earth I think Nuri says that at one point. These people who are so vulnerable to exploitation where there's no protection for them. Mm, mm. And I'm such a practical problem solver. And I think in a way that's why I was so upset by this book because there was no legitimate way for these people to help themselves unless they had money. And ultimately Nuri and Afra do have some money because they were business owners. Mm, And that's mm. what enables them to pay the extortionate smuggling fees to come to the UK. So should we try and sum up our feelings? Maybe I'll go first. I liked this a lot, which is a weird thing to say about something that was so hard to read. I thought the writing was good enough to make me really live these experiences with these characters. And I actually thought there were some things that she did really beautifully. I love the way she wove in the idea of memory and the sense of place. I love the way that they went from the trauma of Aleppo and then the sort of flatness of their life in UK, but then their memories. Occasionally, Nuri thinks back and there's one little passage where he remembers a party that they'd had 
on his um, beekeeping farm, would you call it? Um, the place where they kept all the bees. <laughs> <laughs> Near the apiaries. Apiaries is the only word I've learned about beekeeping from reading this novel. And they had a party for all the people who worked for them. And the way that that was described and the food and the light and the companionship and the sort of beauty of it. I loved the way that this book was a mixture of all of those things. I thought it really worked. Anna. I thought this was a very important book, very compassionate and sensitively done. And it's an accessible book, which I think is a good way in for people to understand this crisis. I didn't love it just because for the most part it was too sad and too slow for me. But then it came together at the end. So mixed feelings for me. Mm. I think it helps that I read this book on a deadline. The deadline being our discussion. (laughs) Because it's not the type of novel I ever want to read. And I just never would have picked it up myself. But having read it, I do feel changed like Kate said and I do feel a sense of urgency I do feel like I need to do something and I'm reminded of how reading can really change you I feel like I don't read many books anymore that do that to me I think if you can have that emotional connection through reading it will change how you then interact with more mainstream articles and press and stories so a really important book I think I will recommend it to people But at the same time, I'll say... Have the tissues. You're going to (laughs) cry really, really hard. (laughs) You're going to cry, but read it anyway. Yeah. I think it is a really good book club book. I think the reading agency and their public, whoever makes that up. Yes, the mysterious public who are referred to on the website. (laughs) (laughs) Who picked this one have got it spot on. Anna, it's been so lovely talking about it with you. I'm sorry that for our first get together to discuss a book together, it was an emotional gut wrench. It was. I agree, though. I think it would be a great book club book. Yeah, it's the sort of book you you almost need to share your experience with reading it with someone, I think. You know, if you just read this on your own and had to sort of process all that by yourself, it's a lot, isn't it? But the great thing is that you can discuss this with people and you can talk to people about this and other people can read it and then you can sort of say, what do you think? What should we do? You know, what can we do? I think it's going to be a great conversation starter. And that's what we love. We love books that get people talking. Inspired by the beekeeper of Aleppo, here are some more books you might like to try for your next book club read. So, Anna, I think you have a recommendation on the tip of your tongue. I do. I read, I think it was last year, No Friend But the Mountains by Beruz Bouchani, translated by Omid Tofigian. Beruz Bouchani is a Kurdish-Iranian asylum seeker who had to flee his home country, arrived in Indonesia, was homeless and starving and managed to get onto a boat, I think on his second attempt and tried to come to Australia. And so the book begins really at the start of that journey. So you get the boat journey and the boat comes into trouble. I don't think all of the passengers on that boat survive that trip but there's a warship that brings them on board, one of the Australian army ships, and they end up in Manus Island, which is a prison that the Australian government has set up for asylum seekers. The policy of the Australian government is if you come by boat, you will never set foot on Australian shores. So it makes Nuri and Afra's bed and breakfast in the beekeeper of Aleppo almost look quite comfortable in a way. Oh my goodness, yeah. Beruz Bouchani was a journalist and poet and filmmaker in Iran and he's also studied philosophy and literature and he has this incredible artistic sensibility that he brings to his writing. This book was tapped out on mobile phone and sent via WhatsApp messages to his translator in Sydney who's Omid Tofigian who's also a philosopher as well as a translator. So the translation in itself is incredibly thoughtful and sensitive to all of the issues that Buchani raises. It's a harrowing read but it is so masterfully written and there's a lot going on in this book. So whilst it's a memoir, it's also a work of prison literature because he then analyses this Manus Island prison set up. It's all his own experience, but he almost elevates it to art, if you see what I mean. Mm. So he gives the people names. One of the things, of course, that dehumanises them is that their names are taken away from them, among many other indignities that are perpetrated, not to mention violence and shocking conditions. 
he gives everyone names and he refuses to conform with that idea and he calls it a prison. The The government calls it a detention centre but he won't conform with that language and he says language is really important. There's so much in this book. It's won a lot of awards. It is, I think, now available in the UK and that is No Friend But The Mountains by Beres Buchani. That's the absolute must read and like The Beekeeper of Aleppo, it is a call to action and it does completely shake you out of your comfort zone and wake you up. It's a very uncomfortable read as an Australian. I think it goes without saying. He's now, I think, in New Zealand but still has no permanent home. Mm. I was going to say, have things changed for him as a result of... Possibly indirectly as a result of the book but he was there for six years and then... The Australian government moved him and they sort of said, well, he's no longer detained, but they moved them to a section of Manus Island where they couldn't leave. So they were essentially still imprisoned because they had no way of moving or working or getting food or anything. He then, I think, was able to visit New Zealand, I think, and I hope that he's still there. But certainly that idea of limbo that we talked about is taken to a real extreme in this book. The other one that I'll just mention briefly is Disoriental by Nagar Javadi, translated by Tina Kova. That's a journey of an Iranian family to try to get to France. So it's not as harrowing and it's a novel, but I think it also draws on her own experiences. It's another one that has that journey and that sense of having to flee your home and the perils that you undergo in doing that. If you wanted to come to this subject through a novel rather than a memoir, then a lot of people have really loved Disoriental. Your description of the Buchani book makes me think of the book we did for the podcast and book club, I Will Never See the World Again by Ahmet Altan, who's a Turkish author who has been imprisoned there for a number of years now. And it's one of those things where you would never think you'd want to read, you know, someone's prison memoir. It's all sort of bleak and hopeless and, you know, he's still Mm. stuck there. But it was so beautifully written. He's obviously a very talented and sort of experienced writer. And then his translator also did a beautiful job. Again, you know, these were smuggled out through his lawyer, you know, taking legal papers in and out. And um, and so, again, it was one of those ones where it sort of smuggled out in fragments and then the translator put it together. But, But, you know, the pleasure of that book comes in this writing. And I think the way it leads you to just consider, you know, what makes us human when everything is taken away from us, when we're forced to flee, when we're put into a situation like that, what are you left with? You know, that's something that comes through in The Beekeeper Aleppo. Maybe it's something that all of these books have in common. While these things are really hard to read, I think that's a really important thing to consider, you know, yeah. that's what literature's for in a way. So they are life enhancing books. And Buchani considers that, I think, quite explicitly because they are reduced almost to being animals. And he really confronts that question and, as I say, brings that philosophical sensibility and political understanding of the systems that are being used in that environment. On the other hand, it makes you think, who are we as humans that we could treat people in that way and in a way that no one's accountable. So the prison guards will say, oh, the orders come from higher up. We're just following orders. We can't let you use the telephone even though it's your last chance to speak to your dying father. It's not your day to use the telephone so we can't let you do that. And then the people in the office in Canberra who supposedly are making these policies would say, oh, that's up to the prison guards how they administer. You know, no one's accountable. No one takes responsibility And that's just one of the elements, really shocking in that sense. But it does come down to the person surviving, you know, and how do you survive that sort of experience? I'm going to recommend a book called What is the What by Dave Eggers. Do you know that one? No, but I know the name Dave Eggers. I've read his journalism. I don't think I've read any books by him. Yeah, he's a very good writer, American writer. His first book, the book that really sort of put him on the map, was called A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius. Yes, <laughs> I've heard And it was that. about, it was a sort of memoir of his mother's death and he ended up raising his younger brother. It's sort of written almost like fiction. You can't quite tell if it's fiction or real, but as the book goes on, you start to understand it and it's pretty much his life. And he also set up the fiction magazine McSweeney's, who are a very inventive, innovative publisher of fiction in the States. And then there was a 
companion magazine called The Believer that was um, non-fiction essays, both of which I love very much, dear to my heart. I think of him as being a little bit hit and miss, actually. I really loved that first memoir he wrote. Mm. And then I read a couple of other things he wrote. I read The Circle, which is something he wrote more recently, which I thought was awful. It's just a dreadful book. <laughs> um, so I feel like, you know, you never, I never quite know with him whether it's going to be something I'm going to love or something I'm going to find really shallow and frustrating. Mm. But um, this book, What is the What?, is about his relationship with a refugee he comes to know who has escaped from Sudan. And it's his story but Dave Eggers is telling it. And and I think because Eggers is a writer who's got this capacity to write really vividly, and he's a really good, maybe like Left Terry, actually, he's a good storyteller. Mm. He can really tell that story. And I was completely wrapped up in this man's experiences and his journey and his eventual escape. And again, it's got that mixture of there's hope at the end of this. What's lovely about this is that the hope comes from the fact that the novel did very well. And they had a kind of fundraising campaign before the days of Kickstarter and things like that. You know, they're quite familiar to us now, but this was quite an early example of that where they raised money to help to rebuild things in this sort of war-torn part of Sudan where he had come from. And they set up a school. And at the end, I remember immediately, like I turned the page and went to the website and donated money. Yeah. And, and, and then you, you, you at least you're able to feel I've been a little bit a part of doing some tiny thing to help. And yes. That matters. But I would say, what is the what? I just thought it was a cracking read as well. You know, it reads like a kind of adventure thriller. Yeah, I think that's important though. I think someone who can tell a story, we look for that. I think we want stories and narratives and that is how we really engage with issues like this in the most profound way. That's all for this episode. Our book recommendations were No Friend But the Mountains by Behrouz Bouchani, Disoriental by Negar Javadi, I Will Never See the World Again by Ahmet Altan, and What is the What by Dave Eggers. And as a little podcast extra, if you don't go away but keep listening at the end, we've got some more recommendations as Anna and I talk about other books we're currently reading, including Cleanless by Garth Greenwell, How Much of These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Zhang, the Nickel Boys and Zone One by Colson Whitehead, Simon the Fiddler and the News of the World by Paulette Giles, Bluebird Bluebird by Attica Locke and Au Revoir Tristesse by Viv Grosskop. To keep up with Anna, you'll find her on Instagram and Twitter at A Bailey Karras. That's B-A-I-L-L-I-E-K-A-R-A-S. Check out Books on the Go on your usual podcast feed and you'll find a great range of written reviews and reading recommendations on her website, booksonthego.net. If you would like to be more involved in helping refugees, check our show notes, where we've included the organisations listed by Christy Lefteri at the end of The Beekeeper of Aleppo. On our next book club show, we'll be discussing That Glimpse of Truth, The Hundred Finest Short Stories Ever Written, edited by David Miller. Laura's book club have been working their way through this with weekly meetings during lockdown. We find out how they've been getting on and also come up with a few of our other favourite lockdown reads. And don't miss our recent interview with Claire Hanscombe of the US-based podcast BritLit. She talks to us about her beach read novel, Unscripted, has some great tips for anyone considering starting a books podcast, and of course, a whole host of great reading recommendations for book club, lockdown and beyond. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you like what we do, please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps other listeners find us and means you'll never miss an episode. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. Anna, what other books are on your radar? I know you've always got so many things that you're reading and you're talking about for the show. What's been keeping you turning the pages recently? We just recorded this morning, Amanda and I read Cleanness by Garth Greenwell. Cleanness is his follow-up to his breakout debut novel, What Belongs to You, which was hailed as an instant classic and which was on my shelf for two years before I finally read it a couple of weeks ago because it takes me that long to get to my TBR. Mm -hmm. And Amanda has said, this is a teaser for the podcast, it will go up next week. She said it's one of her books of the year so far. She really loves it. Loved it. Both of us didn't know much about it going in, but it is a series of short stories, but they're linked by the protagonist who's an American teacher working in Sofia, Bulgaria, which also Garth Greenwell has done. And he has encounters with men. Two stories feature S&M 
encounters and they're quite explicit. So it's not one for audiobook with children in the car. But <laughs> other than that, it's, it's, <laughs> it's incredibly beautifully written. And then there's also a love story. There's obviously some issues there that the narrator faces with his own sense of shame and feeling on the outskirts of things and never really relaxing. But there's also a beautiful love story at the heart of the collection. He's a very, very intelligent man. I don't know if you've heard him speak, but he really thinks about how the sentence works and the Mm. musicality of it and the syntax. And so apart from the high-level issues and the story itself, he's also thinking a lot about the language and yet it reads quite easily. You know, sometimes you read a book that feels like it's been laboured over and that's the worst Mm. sort of thing. But for want of a better word, it's beautifully clean writing. Really loved that one. And I think, oh, we've got so many coming up. We also did How Much of These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Zhang, the debut novel. And Annie and I are going to read The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. Oh, that's so amazing. So that is another one that I've put off because I know that it will be quite harrowing, but we are going to do it. Yeah, it's a tough read, but it's such a brilliant, oh my goodness, it's so good. It's so, so good. That's one of my all-time books that I just thought this is extraordinary when I read it. I loved it. So yeah, I'll be interested to hear what you say because we don't always agree, do we? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now I'm tentatively looking forward to it. I'm actually reading, um, you know, Colson Whitehead wrote a zombie novel. It's called Zone One. Right. I finally think I've got to the point in lockdown and virus pandemic apocalypse where I can read a zombie novel. Yeah. At the beginning, no way. <laughs> so I was just curious to read something that's obviously so different from the other things that I've read of his. Yeah. I actually just started that the other day. What's so exciting is you don't know what he's going to do next because he is so versatile. Yeah, and I think with The Nickel Boys, I had the strongest sense when I finished it, you know, that he was the person to tell that story. It feels like not just anyone could have written that. Mm. It feels right that it was him and that he came to it at the right time and at the right point in his career to really do it justice, which he does in such a searing way. I I thought it was amazing. Have you got anything, um, you know, like anything sort of happy and and light (laughs) on your... Uh, yes. <laughs> Just to offset all this. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I've got a couple. One is Simon the Fiddler by Paulette Giles. And I have no idea if it's happy or light, but her book, The News of the World, which I read a couple of years ago, I found incredibly comforting. And I think there's something about her writing that is warm and comforting that I will just enjoy reading. So I'm expecting that to be highly enjoyable, but really I have no idea. And Mm. then Bluebird, Bluebird by Attica Locke, which is, I think, almost like a crime novel. A park ranger is investigating crimes. And so I'm hoping that will be a bit more plot driven, like a good crime novel is. But yes, it has been a bit grim, hasn't it? There's (laughs) quite a few (laughs) serious books, I have to say. I found Slightly perversely, given that I thought at the beginning of lockdown I would just be wanting comfort reads, I have strangely found myself seeking out these emotionally challenging books. I don't Mm. know whether somehow it feels like they are the right books to be reading at this difficult time in all our lives and that it's not a time for reading things that are frivolous. I don't know, maybe that's been something to do with it. When I look back at my reading pattern over these last sort of few weeks, last couple of months, in a way they've almost got darker and darker to the point where I'm now reading (laughs) zombie apocalypses. And so what else have you got on the go? You have the zombie book. Um, I read a book called The Anna Karenina Fix by an author called Viv Grosskop, oh, yes. which Amanda in my book club gave me for Christmas. I didn't know anything about Viv Grosskop, but and then when I started talking to people about her, it turns out everybody knows about her except me. She's a very well-known columnist. She's a comedian. She has her own podcast. She's, she's really out there in the media landscape. Yeah. I was just the last to know. But The Anna Karenina Fix is a book about Russian literature, which it turns out she knows quite a lot about. She studied Russian and then went to live in Russia for a number of years and was sort of obsessed with the language and the culture and obviously the books as well. And she's written this really funny, wise, informative, irreverent sort of guide to the Russian classics packaged up almost like as a kind of Alain de Bosson, How Proust Can Change Your Life style guide to, you know, what we can learn, what we can take away from the Russian classics that will help us improve our own lives. Fantastic. 
I loved it. It was such a great read. And actually, I'm doing a buddy read of Anna Karenina. That's one of the other things I've had ticking over in the background Yeah. during lockdown with some bookish folk on Instagram, which I've been really enjoying. It's the first time I've done something like that. So I find myself dipping back into the Anna Karenina fix again and again because I just keep being drawn back to these reference points and putting that book and putting Tolstoy's work in the context of Russian literature more generally has been really, really helpful. Oh, that sounds fantastic. And you did War and Peace last year, didn't you? Or the year before, maybe? Yes, last summer. My book club did War and Peace. Amanda, my co-host, is reading Anna Karenina at the moment or has been. She might have finished it by now. And I was saying to her we might do a Russian episode with just a few Russian either classics or modern books. But I might add that one in, the Anna Karenina fix. Oh, do. Yeah, then it would be such like a great one to have in the mix. Yeah, that's perfect. But so she has one just out. She's actually published a couple of other books since then. There's one, I think it's about sort of female empowerment and sort of assertiveness it's called how to own the room um this also seems to be like another strand to her is it a polymath someone who sort of does all these different things brilliantly seems to be another strand to what she's got going on but then she's just published another book called au revoir tristesse as opposed to bonjour tristesse Exactly. And so this is very much the same idea as the Anna Karenina fix, but she's looking at French literature and same thing. She's going through these different writers. She starts with uh, Françoise Sagan. She then goes on to Proust. I've just been reading the Victor Hugo chapter. And again, it's that lovely mix of mm. sort of wise observations about those books. And, and also what I love is the author portraits. You know, Victor Hugo was insane. He was like a kind of... Wow bear of a man with vast sort of sexual appetites um, <laughs> and uh, and yet at the same time was sort of devoted to his family, really loved his grandkids. I mean, one of the things that I've loved about both of these books of hers is the way that these authors become kind of characters in their own right because yeah. they're all just such crazy eccentrics and she really brings that out. So that's been a really nice bit of light relief to everything else I've had going on. Yes, that sounds perfect. And what a great job. <laughs> I sort of want her job now. What a fun book to write. She's amazing. I advise caution when seeking out to find more about her because she's a sort of very daunting individual. You just sort of yeah. look at everything she's done and I find myself thinking, oh God, what am I doing with my Feeling life? Like, Nothing. No, I often feel like an underachiever when I read these <laughs> authors. Just listening to Garth Greenwell this morning on a podcast and just crawled up into a hole, really. I just thought, oh, well, I give up. <laughs> oh, dear. But luckily that feeling I find tends not to last very long. And then I have a chat with Laura, who's a very practical soul, and she gets me back on the kind of path of productivity. <laughs> Very good. Oh, that sounds excellent. Well, I always love talking books with you and it's been so nice to have a chance to do it again. Thanks so much for dialing in. I hope we could do this again sometime. Yes. It'd be really great. Yes, I hope so. Thank you very much for having me.